Okay, so I think we're going to get started with the first panel. And this one is called Climate. It's Climate and the Environment in the Americas. We have two climate panels. Today, we're going to focus on those who reported in the Americas. So we will start with Hannah Wilson Black from the University of Chicago. And I'm just going to give you the title because she'll tell you all about the project. It's Appalachian Changemakers Redefine Environmentalism. Followed by Jackie Lanos from the University of Richmond. Journalists in Puerto Rico adapt to climate change. Adam Goldstein, right here, from the University of Missouri. Wyoming's Path of the Pronghorn. Gabriel Allen from the University of Colorado Boulder Center for Environmental Science. Indigenous knowledge and science intersect in the Arctic. And Muriel Alarcon from Columbia Journalism School, a treasure hidden in Chilean peatlands. So I'm gonna turn this over to Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Hello, hello. All right, I'm excited to kick this off. Let's see. Okie dokie. So um, I'm Hannah Wilson Black. I graduated from the University of Chicago in June, um, and this is my project that I worked on this summer. Uh, so I reported in central Appalachia. This is a map of Appalachia. There's a lot of definitions of it. People argue about it all the time. This is the Appalachian Regional Commission's definition. Um, you can see here uh, I was in central Appalachia, which is um, I went to southern West Virginia, eastern Kentucky, um, southwest Virginia, and uh, western North Carolina, um, which is probably more of the region you think of when you think of Appalachia, um, if you have heard of it. Uh, I chose this region because that's where the eastern coal fields are, and I wanted to explore how coal field communities are sort of reckoning with the energy transition um, that seems to be hitting us all. Uh, so. What I wanted to know, um, I ta I've talked to a lot of Appalachian environmentalists, that's just an interest of mine, um, and something I heard is that um, environmentalists from other parts of the country would say things like, you know, um, why are you working here, it's a lost cause, it's too hard, um, people here don't care about the land, and I knew that that was not true, um, and I suspected that that was not true, and so I went out to find um, what are the barriers to being an environmentalist in Appalachia? You know, what are what are the real problems, um, and what are where are areas of progress happening? Um, so that that was the curiosity I started out with. Um, so here are my interviewees. Um, my priorities in picking people to interview in these regions were uh, young people, um, because you know uh, we are the future. Uh, and then I also talked to some lawyers because. Um, People fighting issues like pipelines and water pollution in Appalachia are fighting legal battles fundamentally, and they're also fighting with their own legislatures. And so lawyers gave me a lot of necessary context. Uh, academics who are talking about the history of environmentalism and labor rights um, advocacy in Appalachia. And then, of course, people who are affected by environmental issues, including activists, but not all of them are activists or would consider themselves activists per se. They may just be affected by an issue. Um, my primary questions that I was asking them, how did you become involved in this? Um, what are sort of the psychology and emotions behind your work? For instance, if you're advocating for solar in a place that has been dominated by the coal industry, when people are resistant to change here, you know, fundamentally, why do you think that happens? Um, and then also, if you could change one thing about your community, what would you change? And that was a question that I got a lot of really great answers to. More of my interviewees. So, I would say my biggest surprises here, I knew going in that there was a lot of community mistrust of people doing um, environmental work in Appalachia, uh, largely because it's a region that's been heavily, heavily dominated by the coal industry. The coal industry, uh, that's people's social lives. They built homes, they built communities, they built churches. Uh, for many, many decades, you could only pay, uh, you would be paid as a coal miner in company script, which you could only buy things with in the company store. So the industry was very, very intentional about making people's entire lives revolve around it. So then when the industry leaves, people's communities are fractured apart. Um, and then also the, 
unions used to be strong in Appalachia, uh, but since the 80s, um, largely due to the Reagan administration, uh, unions have been severely hindered in that region. So communities are kind of, there's a lot of mistrust um, in communities there. What I did not fully appreciate going in was that uh, part of the mistrust of environmental workers who are coming from the government uh, comes from previous interactions that residents there have had with the EPA. Uh, for instance, I was told one story in Eastern Kentucky where um, there was a coal waste spill and so there was coal waste called slurry that was sitting in people's front yards. And the EPA came in to give a presentation about you know, people's concerns. And a representative from the Ohio EPA said, we're not really actually worried about what's happened here today because all of the elements in the coal slurry that's in your backyards are on the periodic table. So you know, we don't think it's going to hurt you. And people were mad about that. Um, and so there are a lot of different forces that have created sort of this mistrust when advocates for solar energy or wind energy come in and say, we would like to sort of transform your community from the way that it's been. Um, we're going to put, you know, solar panels on public school roofs and um, on abandoned mine lands. Sometimes there is a serious hesitancy around that because people say, well, we had energy companies come in here before and say that there was a magical energy source that they were going to transform and it was gonna make us all rich and it was gonna make us all happy and look what's happened now. So that there's also a long history um, of labor and environmental activism in Appalachia. Uh, Mother Jones, for instance, if you've ever heard of her, she's a major, major um, labor and environmental activist. Also, uh, people don't often know that Rosa Parks was actually trained um, in nonviolent civil resistance, partly at a, a school in Tennessee um, called the Highlander Center. So there's a real history there that people are engaging in today when they're engaging in environmental work. So I would say my sort of biggest takeaway, which I tried to sum up in like two sentences, um, is that in central Appalachia, there's a very real and accumulated mistrust of both energy providers and government. And the problem is that with the energy transition that we're seeing now, um, those are the two biggest actors who are trying to make that happen. And so repairing this community mistrust requires solutions, which I find are difficult to articulate to the reading public. Uh, but I'm trying. Uh, there's a long time frame in sort of trying to repair this community mistrust. Uh, advocates have to be local. They have to work on these issues for a long time. They have to talk to people like in the checkout line at Walmart and say, hey, um, me and my group are trying to put solar panels on your kid's school. Um, you know, Here's the information about it. Here's how we're gonna employ local people to do it. And here's how we're trying to build an industry here. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of different sort of factors that environmentalists attributed their success to. So uh, where you can find me and read about this stuff. I'm currently living in Huntington, West Virginia. So if you ever happen to be coming through the mountain state, uh, I'm there. That's where Marshall University is in Huntington. Uh, and then also uh, my stuff from this project is coming out in Grist and it's coming out on the Daily Yonder. Um, that's a QR code for my website. And then you can also find me on Twitter. Please, please talk to me about this stuff. Um, I could talk about this for hours, and so I'm, I'm really excited that I got to share these kinds of stories through this opportunity. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jackie Janus. I just graduated from the University of Richmond where I studied journalism and my project is about how Puerto Rican journalists are adapting to work in a post-Maria environment. For those of you who don't know about Hurricane Maria, this was a major hurricane that came through Puerto Rico on September 20, 2017. It was a category five hurricane, which is the strongest you can have and it wiped out the electric grid in some areas of the island for up to a year. Um, and the biggest emphasis that journalists I talked to wanted me to uh, look at was everything in Puerto Rico they said, and it was everything in Puerto Rico is described as happening either before or after Maria. So this is really how much of an impact the hurricane has had in the island. Um, and two of the main takeaways that I had was that uh, journalism in Puerto Rico has thrived after Maria because these uh, organizations are working together. 
So this, besides the emotional turmoil that journalists had to experience while covering the devastation in the island after Hurricane Maria, they also face uh, financial setbacks throughout the whole industry. The second largest newspaper in the island, El Nuevo Día, uh, had layoffs of 59 people just a month after the hurricane. So, um, and also some other TV stations and radio stations had to shutter for months because their transmitters and antennas did not work. So people were out of work. Um, out of that, uh, outlets have started recuperating and they have done so by collaborating. One of the examples that I have is uh, Metro PR, which is a weekly newspaper based in San Juan, publishes stories from the Center of Investigative Journalism in Puerto Rico, which is an online-only outlet. And um, so they publish it on the weekly paper to make sure that people who don't like to look at news online can also read it in an actual paper. And another of the big takeaways that I had was that the people who are pushing for change in the industry tend to be older uh, journalists who have had fruitful careers in legacy media, whether that's the newspapers of record or long established radio stations. They find that they still have a calling to provide news to the island after they have retired. Um, one of these journalists, his name is Jaime Torres Torres, he works in the Northeast portion of the island and he told me, you know, I wouldn't have been able to launch a news site that he has called Prensa Sin Censura, Press Without Censorship, if it hadn't been um, until, I, until he had retired because he's using those funds to, uh, to put the news that he's producing now online. And another thing that he's pushing for is citizen journalism uh, for people who are interested in covering events that are happening in their own towns but might not have the means to go and get a journalism degree. And I wanted to uh, study Puerto Rico. I had known about the history of its uh, political state as not quite being one of the states and not quite being independent. And um, I also learned more about the problems with the electric grid, which are just besides losing power during hurricanes, Puerto Ricans also face blackouts uh, basically on a daily basis. So uh, people really can't just rely on the electric grid. A lot of people have generators, and now there's been a push for solar energy. And I learned more about this in Naomi Klein's book, The Battle for Paradise, which I recommend people read because it's a great book that talks about um, disaster capitalism in Puerto Rico that happened after Maria. And this is a quote from the book that talks about Casa Pueblo, which is a community-based organization uh, that started in 1980 and has been pushing for climate justice ever since. Um, and uh, Casa Pueblo is located in Adjuntas, which is a town, as you can see, they have uh, 17,000 people there, and it's located in the middle of the country, in the, in the middle of the country, in the mountains. So I traveled here uh, because uh, Adjuntas and Casa Pueblo has been really a pushing uh, entity in getting electric self-determination through solar power. Uh, and as you can see, obviously, they also have a radio station there. And um, they acquired this radio station in 2010. And during Hurricane Maria, uh, the people of Adjuntas were able to get some information in and out through the radio station, which at the time, the actual station where people were working was powered through solar energy. But the transmitter that was deep in the mountains had a generator. So after realizing this, um, Arturo Masol de Yard, that's the director of Casa Pueblo right there, he decided that this radio station was too good of a resource for them to have it rely on just the generator. So in 2018, they invested $73,000 in, in solar panels to power the transmitter. So that's when they became the first radio station in the Caribbean to be entirely powered by solar energy. And um, this is Vivian Matei Colon. Uh, she has worked with them for 40 years, and she's also leading the restructuring committee for the radio station. And um, as you can, as uh, I said before, she's one of the people who are the older change makers. She was a professor at a journalism at a 
at a journalism school in a university in Ponce, the second largest city, and she also worked as a journalist for a long time, but now she's trying to bring more news to Radio Casa Pueblo through partnerships with other radio stations in the island. And um, this picture here shows uh, some of the solar panels that they have at Casa Pueblo. And it's meant to look like a forest. Um, and this also right here is a quote from Arturo. Um, he is very critical of entities in Puerto Rico that have not yet switched to solar energy, knowing that they really can't rely on the grid. But um, also another interesting bit that shows that collaboration within Puerto Rican journalists is that um, the Center for Investigative Journalism um, got, um, got together with Arturo when they decided to have solar panels installed in their headquarters and they relied on Casa Pueblo and Arturo for advice about how to, um, how to do it. So now um, the Center for Investigative Journalism has solar panels in its roofs that don't power them the whole time, but when the electric grid goes down, they still have that backup energy through solar power. And um, that's it. And I just wanted to point out that uh, Casa Pueblo also has a newspaper uh, that's all about news. And as you can see, it's not only about climate news in Puerto Rico. They talk about the Caribbean as a whole. And it's also edited by a journalist who works in uh, another outlet in this southern region. So that just goes to show that journalists in Puerto Rico are really tied to one uh, outlet. They collaborate. Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Goldstein. I'm a recent graduate of the University of Missouri's Master's in Journalism program, and I currently work at the New Bedford Light in New Bedford, Massachusetts, covering climate and environmental issues. Uh, this summer, I chose to do a story on the path of the pronghorn in Wyoming. And I just love this photo for a number of reasons. I mean, one, I mean, look at these animals. They're beautiful. You know, they're truly one of the real renewable resources of Wyoming. I mean, I mean, Wyoming is a state makes roughly 500 million a year in a wildlife viewing through the parks alone, as well as multiple hundreds of millions of dollars in hunting tags and uh, other essential recreation economies. The recreation economy is very strong in Wyoming. I also want you to notice there's only, as you can see, three of them. And there were only 25 pronghorn this summer in Grand Teton National Park. There was a really devastating winter this year that knocked out essentially roughly 70% of the broader herd called the, the sublet pronghorn herd, which uh, is the largest in the United States, 40,000 animals in the southwest corner of Wyoming. And it, while there was a lot of you know, uh, distress among local community members and wildlife advocates, one of the silver linings that a lot of people really point to are migration corridors which in, in the Mountain West, these are really, I mean, they're migration quarters for any kind, number of animals, including butterflies, fish, whales, sea turtles, and Panama. But in the Mountain West, really what it's known for is these long distance corridors of, uh, of big game animals, mule deer, elk, pronghorn like these. And these pronghorn every year travel 180 miles on foot over the course of three days uh, to the southwest corner of Wyoming to survive a harsh winter and find adequate forage. These, uh, there are more than 50 migration corridors in Wyoming. They're super critical. I mean, scientists are across the country and, and within the state, which is a leader in the area, believe that these are critical for the ecosystem function of Greater Yellowstone, our first national park, as well as, for, um, uh, as, well as to serve as a linkage in the food chain for other creatures. Grand Teton is one of the few national parks that has the full complement and full suite of native wildlife in the area. And so that said, only the upper two thirds of the path of the pronghorn, which is the one federally recognized migration corridor, are protected. The, the park is protected by the National Park Service and these pronghorn on their trips in north and south in the spring, in the fall, in the spring and fall respectively, will uh, essentially pass through the park the Bridger Teton National Forest, which signed a memorandum of understanding to limit development in these corridors, as well as BLM land. These animals are pretty uh, frisky, as I would say. Uh, really, uh, they, they work 
They avoid development of any kind, whether that be renewable energy, uh, gas and oil, which is really the predominant one, housing and grazing. And so it really appealed to me. I found out about this story through a coalition to protect the National Parks Report when I was working here, actually, as an intern in the state's newsroom on F Street. And uh, I, I just thought it was really captivating that this is a lone recognized uh, migration corridor federally, but it's not even protected. The protections are inconsistent in terms of in the lower third is essentially facing numerous uh, challenges. When I first discovered this story, my original angle was to cover a lawsuit that the Center for Biological Diversity filed. These pronghorn are also an iconic conservation story. I think they were down to around 20,000 nationwide before recovering to, I think, over a population of hundreds of thousands now in the state through, you know, due to overhunting. And so, I mean, what really appeals to me about this story is this isn't really just oil and gas versus the environment. It's not corporate green versus, you know, hippies. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really the, uh, it's, it's a battle over open space and what we do with our open space. And I spoke with the scientist John Beckman who mentioned that, you know, the human footprint on the United, on the United States and globally is so large that there's just going to have to be some places that we just don't develop uh, in order to keep uh, these epic migration corridors and these resources available. Uh, so my time on the ground was actually kind of jarring. As I mentioned, I only saw three pronghorn in the park. And I went out with this guy, Brandon Skirlock, who's a, a wildlife coordinator with the Wyoming Fish and Game. These guys have I mean, tracked the path of the pronghorn for 20 plus years and have really narrowed down the map. And when I went out with him, what was surprising and what he mentioned was, it was beautiful. I mean, you can see these, these teal tone sagebrush and the entirety of the, the space was marked by bones. I mean, there were no pronghorn. The space was sparse. And as we mentioned, I mean, I kind of thought I was going to go into this story being a story on Pack the Pronghorn. And I think what I really ended up doing is this is going to be a story about the absence of the Pack of the Pronghorn and the absence of this wildlife. So I kind of came to grow, grow to readjust my mindset from looking at Pack the Pronghorn uh, so much as a subject, so much as a symbol of migration corridors in the broader field. So I really tried to widen my angle. Uh, I also spoke with Brandon here, and he spent a lot of time. We went and we drove to the Grovon Mountains, which is a mountain range an hour and a half north of his home. He spent like pretty much the whole day with me. And uh, we really got to, you know, driving around in the car, talk about solutions to this. And something that he and I really both, uh, I, we were on a, a webinar together, kind of coincidentally, a couple weeks earlier, and we started to talk about these conservation leases, which the BLM land, the last unprotected third, generally has a financial duty to make money off that land. It's just kind of been integrated over the years historically. And uh, essentially the idea is this rule would bring conservation to become a, a money-making use under BLM land. So instead of having grazing on this public land or oil extraction on this public land, we can now bring up conservation as a use on this public land. And companies like, or companies, organizations like the Nature Conservancy or backcountry hunters and anglers or others could bid on certain subsections of land in the, uh, in the Wyoming area to essentially serve it as conservation, use this to protect migration corridors. I mean, I talked to the brain, he said money talks in this area, uh, and really, I mean, if we could like secure a 250 acre strip of, my, of migration corridor for his, as restoration land, this could make a huge difference. Uh, door rocking on the ground. I really also thought I'd be able to go into Pinedale, Wyoming, which is a small town uh, of, I think, roughly 15,000, and try to just get a feel for what people thought. And I was just, <laughs> I was struck by just kind of how people weren't really trying to talk about this. I mean, a lot, for a lot of them, it was a lost cause. The Pinedale region is really dominated by oil and gas. Two of the largest natural gas fields in the country are in this area. And Wyomingites, uh, as, as my, one of my interviewees, Emily Austin, said, said, you can have both wildlife and you can have development, but you can't always have both. So I, I went on another hike to the Grovant Range. My real takeaways from this were, you know, if your original story uh, doesn't really have the legs, I mean, there are ways to widen your angle and pivot and still create an impactful story that will, you know, uh, make an impact. And secondly, I mean, while the path of Pronghorn is just one migration corridor, there are so many out there that we don't even know, and we've lost 70%. So and these are really key to, you know, maintain the wildlife and the biological diversity that makes our ecosystems function. So, thank you.
All right. Uh, so if I haven't met you yet, my name's Gabe Allen. I'm a master's student at the University of Colorado. And um, this summer I traveled to Utkiagbek, Alaska, which is the northernmost community in the United States. Um, I wrote a story called Whales, Whalers, and Lab Coats. Uh, it's not out quite yet, but you can find my field note on the website. And today I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, the more subjective side of things, my experience traveling to this unique place and, and reporting there. So this is a map of Alaska. Uh, the pin that's dropped is Ukiagvik. You can see it's right at the tip. And it's part of the North Slope, which is that northernmost chunk of the state. Um, on the south, it's guarded by this really formidable mountain range called the Brooks Range. And then the interior of the territory is permafrost, rivers, wetlands. It's really hard to build and maintain infrastructure in this place. And so there's really no roads between places. Um, and, and it's pretty inaccessible as a result. Utkiagvik is the only place with a jet service uh, to it, but you can't miss your flight because there's only one a day. Um, so I snuck in there for a week this summer. Um, yeah, so uh, going into this trip, I knew I was interested in um, whaling in the community and subsistence hunting. It's a really important part of the food system there uh, in a place where, you know, a pack of soda costs 16 or $17 because everything has to get shipped in. Um, so I wanted to, to talk to folks about these practices and how they were changing as the climate warmed. It's happening four times faster in the Arctic than the global average. So things are changing really quickly. Um, but beyond these really pretty broad questions, uh, I didn't know who was going to be in my story. I didn't have a focus yet. And so I started calling people and emailing people in the community. And I was getting nothing back for a while. It was like totally silent on the other end. And I couldn't figure out why until I was talking with a uh, researcher from the University of Alaska. And they told me that the fiber op optic cable that brings internet and cell service to Ukiagvik had been severed by shifting ice uh, right as I was starting my pre-reporting. So everybody was without any service. And um, yeah, it was just like essential government uh, uh, departments were just getting Starlink shipped in just to be able to send emails again. Um, I landed in Utkiagvik on June 19th, and I just had to start talking with strangers and knocking on doors. Uh, I actually went into the local ra radio station, KBRW, and was interviewed on the morning show about what I was doing. Uh, and just, I was like, please come talk to me. Like, I'm only here for a week. Um, I really need some, uh, some interviews. And eventually one person led to the next, and I started talking to people um, every day. So uh, the first group of people that I started meeting were actually scientists. Uh, this is my, my dormitory for the week on the left. This was my bedroom window right here. Uh, and so I was in a, a science barracks that's uh, maintained by the, the local indigenous corporation. Um, and this is uh, me and a seasonal research assistant taking a plunge in the Arctic Ocean. And it is as cold as it looks. Um, <laughs> So, uh, oh yeah, before I move on from that. So there's, sci there's a lot of scientists in Utkiagvik. This is a, a big portion of who's there during the summer. And they're studying all kinds of things from uh, permafrost dynamics to uh, sea ice dynamics, wildlife, polar bears, Arctic birds. Um, there's all these research groups up there during the summer. The second group of people that I met were, of course, the locals, the people that live there all year round. And the community in Utkiagvik is uh, majority in Yupiat, which is the um, uh, subgroup of, of Inuits that's native to northern Alaska. Um, and I was there during Nalakatuk, which is their summer whaling festival. And these are some images from that. So um, uh, on the upper uh, left-hand corner here, that's a whaling crew member giving out muktuk, which is whale blubber. Um, and giving it out to a family. And, and so the families that come to each day of Nalakatuk, they'll bring a couple of jumbo sized coolers uh, and everybody will have a bowl and a spoon and they'll just get fed all day. So it's caribou stew and pie and coffee and tea and sweet bread. Um, but really like the heart of, of what this festival is, is about is sharing the meat that gets taken each year. So. Um, the the muktuk they're getting pounds and pounds of this they're filling up those coolers and then that 
that food will last them for many months um, after the festival's over. And then uh, up in the upper right-hand corner, this is the prayer that happens near the beginning of each day of the festival. Uh, the lower right-hand corner, this is blanket toss. So they take a seal skin off of one of their whaling boats, string it up between these poles, and toss people up in the air. People will go up with bags of candy and sort of shower it on the kids. Um, and then in the lower left-hand corner, this is Colleen Apkick LeMay. She's a local historian. And she like took me on a deep dive of kind of the history of whaling, which ended up be, being really essential to my story. Um, so yeah, after a few days, a story started to form. And I realized it, it was really different from the story I went in wanting to tell. What was really interesting to me were these instances where the two kinds of people that I had been, been meeting, the Inupiat and the scientists, where they were working together effectively. And one great example of this was the North Slope Borough Wildlife Department. Um, this summer, uh, so the work that they do, it brings wildlife biologists, uh, geologists, and um, local holders of indigenous ecological knowledge together around issues. And this summer, they're working on a study of uh, kidney worm infections. So the whalers, uh, one of the whalers that I met this summer had caught a whale this spring and noticed this new parasite. And he had taken it to the department. And now uh, the study that they're working on brings together a, a, a rigorous scientific inquiry from the local veterinarian. And also um, just a collection of the observations uh, and an analysis of the observations from the people that are actually out there every year, spending days on days uh, in the wilderness. Um, so it's really collaborative from start to finish. And at the end, they'll walk away with the best understanding of this new parasite and the threat that it possesses. This collaborative work benefits everyone. Um, the community gets a safer food source and peace of mind. The scientists get to do good work and they get to ask the right questions that really come from observations and time spent in nature. Um, and visiting journalists get to write a good story, hopefully. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I guess the last thing I'll say is that the environmental stressors that in places like this are increasing and they're getting a lot more complex with warming. And so this kind of work is, is really important right now and it's important that it continues into the future. Um, in the past, there's been a lot of mistrust on both sides and it's led to things like a whaling ban that was devastating to the community. Um, and there still is some of that mistrust, but uh, there's also those instances when they've worked uh, together really, really well. So I'll leave you guys with this quote from Raphaela Stimmelmayer, who is the wildlife veterinarian there. Traditional ecological knowledge is an inherent knowledge system that has theory behind it and goes through the same motions as Western inquiry. Research will always benefit if you bring the two together. Thank you. Um, my name is Muriel Alarcón. I am a Chilean journalist. You will notice because of my accent, and don't be surprised if you start to hear new words, Span Spanglish, <laughs> in, the mid, in the mid of the presentation. Um, I, am, I am an MA uh, in science journalism from Columbia Journalism School. I am also a climate science um, Pulitzer Center reporting fellow this year. Uh, Fernando Larcón is a brilliant uh, filmmaker, uh, photographer. Um, he was also my reporting partner during this adventure, and he also happens to be my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, because okay, no, no, no yet, no yet. Wait me a little bit. So um, the story I will share with you is one of the most challenging ones I have ever had the chance to be uh, covering. Um, it's particularly excite me because uh, it takes place in my home country, Chile, uh, but it impacts directly 
all of us in this room. I also shared this with my grandma this last Sunday. I used to uh, have lunch with her every Sunday. Um, this uh, 90 years old wise woman follows every single story I write. Um, and she was quite surprised about uh, this story. Um, when I told her uh, that I was going to present you the story about Chilean peatlands. Peatlands? What is peatlands? Um, so I answered her, well, a sort of wetlands. But why are you writing about peatlands if you are always writing about people? Um, I answered her, and I have the goal with this story, uh, to demonstrate that the story of peatlands is the story of people. Uh, it's the story of how people relate to environment. It's the story of people understand the environment. I confess to her that I hadn't heard about peatlands before I started the research. I don't know if you have heard about them. Uh, can, can you raise the hands, the ones that? OK, yeah. Not many, OK. <laughs> um, so seen from above, peatlands are a sort of craters uh, in the midst of the forest, overflow by water, um, sprinkled with moss uh, that cracks its surface in the same way as stretch marks uh, are on the skin. Um, I want to invite you to uh, travel with me for a few seconds uh, to these landscapes that are crucial in regulating climate. Okay, so to be immersed in a peatland, you need plastic boots. And you must follow local advice if you don't want to fall down. Um, Tourist steps without crossing uh, feet also. Um, looking for the highest and hardest parts of this sort of water bed mattress that are also uh, that is very sticky. In fact, uh, many people get stuck in this uh, place and have to get out of their own boots uh, to rescue them. Uh, peatlands play a crucial role in regulating the air climate by capturing uh, carbon from the atmosphere. This means that if they are today damaged, they can stop being carbon sinks and become being uh, large emitters of carbon. In fact, globally, peatlands hold more than twice as much carbon as the world forests do, according to the United Nations. So, uh, Spanum magellanicum grows in peatlands. Uh, uh, this moss uh, in Chile is better known as pompon because it's named in Mapudungun, which means a sponge. Uh, it's capable of absorbing up to 20 times its own weight in water. Well, today in Chilean Patagonia, the pompon is exploited to be marketed particularly to Asia, and specifically to Taiwan, as substrate for plants. And this is really, and this was very amazing for me, because it is particularly used to feed orchids. In Chile, we don't have orchids. So the pompon has given job uh, to many Patagonian people these last 20 years, but it indiscriminate exploitation has uh, put pet peatlands uh, at risk. Today there is a bill uh, being discussed that um, is seeking to protect peatlands while uh, by regulating the extraction of this moss. But it has sparked a big debate 
among different groups, but particularly among environmentalists and collectors, also known in Chile in Spanish as pomponeros. Um, of course, do their different positions about the use of petlands. Uh, while environmentalists want them to remain intact, pomponeros, of course, want to continue extracting pompon. Um, so during my research, I heard, I heard, as always, reporting many, many versions of the same story, but there were some exceptional ones. And I want to remind and share with you some uh, of them, for instance, uh, Segundo Quintui, uh, a farmer who owns a peatland in Chile, an island that today is suffering about uh, from water scarcity. He said this, his peatland was his uh, main source of, of water in a place that doesn't have cordillera, as in the rest of Chile. But also I heard the story of Guillermo Correa, a leader among pomponeros, that says that without extracting pompon, he would lose his house and his children would lose their education. So as a professor in journalism, I always ask my students to, uh, to, uh, students to uh, find the conflict in their stories. But also I invite them to find the solution. And I found the solution in science. So this story is about, um, my research is about following a group of Chilean scientists who are today um, leaving behind the laboratory and taking uh, action and being part of the problem. They are trying to find balance based, of course, uh, on data, seeking for sustainable ways to extract pompon, but also uh, requiring damage uh, peatlands. In fact, Carolina Leon, who lead the investigation, uh, dreamed of learning the pomponeros, the collectors, um, to exploit the damaged peatlands and to extract from these places the pompon. Uh, I follow this path particularly. Uh, because it seems to me to be the most conciliatory one uh, among the environment and, of course, the people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Muriel. And thank you to all of the environmental panelists. That was terrific and wonderful presentations. We now want you to come up to the table. And we're going to open this up to questions. I think I'd like to start by seeing if you have questions for each other. You can also ask questions of each other during the Q&A. But if anyone has a burning question right now, uh, we're going to start with you. So, I, I have a question for, for you, Hannah. Oh, sure. Um, were there, oh, wait, sorry. Yeah. Be sure to talk into the mic oh, because this is this is being <laughs> recorded, so we need to make sure that everybody talks into the mic. Yeah. Um, I was curious curious if you came across any efforts to uh, take former coal workers and bring them into renewable industries in Appalachia. Yeah. So um, funny enough, I just started a job at an organization that does that. Um, I'm actually not on the team of people who works on that specifically, but we do have a branch of the team that does that. Um, yeah, the idea, one of the ideas is that if you have worked underground for a long time um, in the coal mines or on the surface mines, you have a lot of mechanical, electrical, and physical like manual labor skills that are also really essential in, for instance, installing solar panels. Like a lot of installing solar panels is wiring and electrical wiring. Um, and so, the, the difficulty right now is scaling it up, uh, essentially, because, I mean, just a couple of days ago, there was like another mass layoff announced at a coal mine in Southwest Virginia. That's 135 people who are going to be out of work in two months. And so, like, the challenge right now is just sort of making sure that the state laws are friendlier to renewable energy because only once these projects can get going more and more um, are we able to hire more and more people to learn how to install. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of efforts to do that. And the other thing 
about um, the coal region in particular is that there's a lot of land that used to be strip mines that are now, if you reclaim them properly, which is a whole thing in and of itself because the coal industry sort of has to pay for that and they don't like to, but um, on reclaimed mine lands, that's a great place to potentially install solar arrays because that land has been flattened, which is unfortunate for mountaintop removal activists, but once it's already happened, uh, the land is flat, which is one of the requirements for building a solar array so the sun can shine directly on it. So there's a lot of uh, land there, and as well as like a labor force. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, a, it's a possibility that a lot of people are working on. I have a question for Jackie, which is that, so I mean, you talked a little bit about, you know, a lot of the uh, renewable work that some of these radio stations and local media organizations are doing. I'm curious as to what they told you about storm resiliency. I mean, after Maria hit, I'm sure that that knocked out a lot of their operations. And I'm kind of curious as to, I mean, what they mentioned about, you know, maybe uh, securing their facilities or securing their equipment. So uh, in the event of a major storm, they, they would be prepared or what they what they said about that. Yeah, one of the organizations, well, one of the outlets that I talked to, uh, La Perla del Sur in Ponce, they actually were one of the uh, print papers that had to shut down. And they recently came back as an online only news outlet. And um, they don't have any headquarters. So when they talked to me about their, um, their preparedness plan, when a hurricane comes through, their new owners also own some hotels in the area. So um, usually what some Puerto Ricans do when, if they have the money, when the hurricanes come, they go to hotels because they know that hotels have stronger generators and they know that there will be food and water there. So um, what the La Perla del Sur has as a backup plan is that they also have available uh, conference rooms in these hotels to be able to work from there. Now, that's not a foolproof plan because they told me that when Fiona came through last year, um, the hotel that they were staying at had some issues with the generator. OK, thank you. Other questions over here? OK. Uh, do we have questions here? Yes. Go ahead. You, yes. Oh, wait. I have to give you the mic. Uh, I have a question for Hannah. Uh, first of all, I really liked your project, and congratulations on getting published in Grist. I'm very excited to read it. Uh, but uh, I remember you talked about the legal battles, and I was just curious to know what the legal battles for this looked like, and are they legal battles involving environmentalists in Appalachia, and if there's been a historical trend if it's changed lately? So I was just curious about that. Yeah, so I'll talk about pipelines specifically because um, uh, the story I wrote for the Daily Honor was largely about the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which has been under construction for, oh gosh, it's probably going on five, six years now. Um, the cost of the project has ballooned to $6.6 .6 billion. There are currently activists like chained to the pipeline along the route. Um, so activists have slowed that project down. Like you can actually see it in real time that that's what's happened here. Basically like there are so many eyes on it right now that anytime there's a water violation um, when they're building, because the pipeline has to go over water crossings. And so anytime there's like a environmental violation, there are eyes on it, which I think has seriously, it hasn't stopped the project. Um, and even if the project never becomes operational, then you can't dig up that pipe again because that causes further damage, so it'll just sit there. Um, but you can see, I think, in real time, these projects hitting major obstacles. It doesn't mean they're being stopped, but it means that there's a lot of attention on them. Um, one legal story in particular that I'm tracking that nobody seems to want so far, possibly because it's very wonkish, um, is that uh, there is a lawsuit right now that I think may end up in the Supreme Court uh, in the next couple of years that's currently going through the DC Circuit Courts. Uh, it's a lawsuit that would basically prevent the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission from allowing corporations to seize land because that's the way that these pipeline projects happen. Uh, if you've ever heard of uh, eminent domain, people who study national parks um, you know, know about this kind of thing. It's an act of Congress to declare eminent domain. That means the federal government can essentially come in and say, we need your land as a private citizen for a public project. Pipelines, um, pipeline corporations, 
uh, have been given the power of eminent domain. Eminent domain by the Federal Ener Energy Regulatory Commission, as long as FERC decides that the pipeline is a public necessity. Um, so then it's legally like it's okay for the pipeline to basically knock on your door and say, hey, we're going to need to build through your backyard. And if you don't like that, you're going to have to take us to court. So right now, there's a massive lawsuit with landowners from West Virginia and Virginia um, who are basically saying we want to strip the ability of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to do that at all. If we want to build a pipeline, you're going to have to go, it's going to have to be passed by Congress, which would make things harder. OK, thank you. OK, hi, everybody. Congrats to everybody. I thought all your projects were really interesting. And I guess my question is for the group, but it was inspired by Jackie, because you mentioned something about how people consume media. And I was just curious, in general, if you guys encountered people who, like their perceived risk or their perceived understanding of a climate-related event or an environmental-related event um, depended on how they consumed that media. So did it matter that they got it from print? Did it matter that they got it from radio? Did it matter that they watched it on the news or online? I don't know if that's like a really nuanced question, but you brought it up, Jackie, when, when you were talking about that print versus uh, online option. So. Yeah, um, well, radio stations specifically in Puerto Rico are really important because they tend to be the only thing that can stay up when the grid goes down during a hurricane. So um, that's why um, projects like Casa, um, Radio Casa Pueblo are very important. And if their generator goes down, then they're completely out. So relying on solar energy uh, is a way to be able to continue broadcasting. And um, I also heard that social media uh, is becoming a bigger uh, venue for people to find the news in Puerto Rico. Uh, most of the population of Puerto Rico tends to be older, so they like to be <laughs> on Facebook. Uh, so that's where some of the retired journalists are turning to build an audience. <clears throat> Um, hello, everyone. Firstly, amazing projects. Um, my question is also for Jackie. You talked a lot about how um, there's a big reliance on citizen journalism now. So were, did you happen to find out how citizen journalism is regulated there? Um, well, the way that journalism has worked uh, in Puerto Rico is that uh, one of the things is that they don't have an open records law like we have here in the state. So uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to access information from the government. Um, so there, as far as I know, there is no regulation when it comes to citizen journalism, but people have turned to independent and niche outlets outside of legacy media because there tends to be um, larger polarization in terms of political commentators with ties to the government, and people are unhappy at the government right now. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, my question is for Adam. Um, you mentioned that you ended up seeing the path of the pronghorn as a symbol as opposed to the subject of your story. I'm wondering how that influenced how you approached the story from then on out. Interesting question. I mean, I think um, I kind of realized that like, oh, is this, is this on? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what I really realized is that like there were, I went into that story with a number of angles and I think that was like a really key thing that I'm sure a lot of the rest of you did is when you pre-report, I mean, you, you have to be ready for the story to change. You have to be ready to not be able to meet with the source. You have to be ready for a lot of things. So, I mean, I saw the path, the pronghorn story is kind of, there was, there were two outlets for me. One was really diving into the local perspective, which was the story I really wanted to do in the lawsuit. And, you know, really kind of zooming in on this is kind of like what, uh, as an embodiment of the problem. But as I kind of realized that like that wasn't going to be feasible for me, I would kind of realize, okay, maybe I could turn the path of the pronghorn into a section of my story, you know, where I talk to local advocates. I, I use it as an example, but I don't use it as, you know, the, I don't weave, you know what I mean? I was kind of like, I'm not going to weave this throughout the story so much as I can kind of set it up, then kind of go to the history of migration corridors, then go to the path of the pronghorn, then go to the conservation lease rule. 
So essentially just kind of condensing that, but also like maintaining it as a, you know, integral piece of the story. Uh, I mean, it's just a matter of like changing your framing, I think, but I think it was a prudent choice given the material I got. Okay, thank you. And I have a question now. Uh, Gabe, you mentioned that you found some of your sources by going on the morning show. And I'm wondering if anyone else on the panel had an interesting way to access sources, mm -hmm. something non-traditional or perhaps traditional. How did you reach your sources? I mean, and, uh, go ahead, Muriel. Right. Ah, well, okay. So thank you. Ah, super interesting um, question, um, specifically because the um, story I shared with you is right now um, taking place in a, like a specific uh, geographic zone. Um, and what is happening right now because of the bill, there are many workshops going on from different, that are today led by uh, groups, very well organized, that are trying to uh, promote their own view of things. You know, the bill, as I said, uh, has sparked this different, uh, this, this big conflict. So I, when I was reporting, I, I remember one day in the morning, like I spent the whole morning, with um, pomponeros uh, and uh, of course hearing them and understanding the issue they were dealing of course they are today uh, very worried about losing their main uh, source of job and at the same day like <laughs> I took the car and I went to the meeting with um, environmentalists that were celebrating the global day of the global peatlands day something like that and they were discussing completely the opposite side. So, I mean, when the story is taking place uh, in, like, literally in the place, uh, and 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 it's um, currently happening as this one, like I, uh, I think that the, you you don't really need to um, do much uh, to be part of the story. Like I was like immersing in this group in the same way other one like a witness, you know, much more than a journalist because I really wanted to not be seen there. Uh, then, of course, I approach and when I interview them, I, I, I present myself as a journalist and I explain what was my motivation. But that was uh, like a really a great opportunity that I have that because of the bill, the, the sources were um, giving their own view of things in the place I was. Yep. Questions over here. Anybody? Yes. yes. Hi, uh, my question is for Jackie, actually. So I was really fascinated by all the presentations, but Jackie, with you in particular, I kept thinking about some of the post-colonial criticism about climate control when it comes to racial and social justice in particular. And even listening to your questions during the Q&A, your answers during the Q&A session, I was just curious about how you will make correlations between like environmental justice, justice, racial justice, social justice. And part of my inspiration for that question is because of your comments about people, citizens normally staying in hotels during hurricanes because of the resources there. Could you speak more about that? Yeah, so Casa Pueblo, as I mentioned, is really a community organization based in climate justice. So uh, the programming that they do right now is not necessarily hard news. Uh, Arturo actually has a, a radio show just based in climate justice. And um, what the book I mentioned also talks about those disaster capitalists. It really just harkens back to the state of Puerto Rico as basically a colony. Um, and that's what a lot of the journalists that I spoke with also felt and the way that journalism works in Puerto Rico is really, uh, it mimics how it works in the US, but then that also, after Maria, it proved that it didn't work because many of them had to shut down and because the economy just didn't give leeway for them to keep going. So yeah, as I mentioned, the people who can afford to stay in, um, people who can afford to stay in hotels do so, but that's not really feasible for a lot of the journalists as well. So. While they're reporting, they're also having to deal with 
okay, the the system isn't working for me right now because back at home, I don't have any electricity either. They're worried about their families. Um, so it really, it's, um, you know, they mentioned about, you know, you have to stay, um, you have to stay unbiased as a journalist, but those things really affect them on their daily lives. So, um, yeah. And then also another thing that the journalist mentioned as another set of hits, um, they mentioned that after Maria, they have really just experienced hit after hit after hit. Um, one of them was the political unrest that came in 2019 um, that ended up in the governor resigning. And part of that came out of the government's undercounting of how many people died during Maria. And uh, those numbers really came about when the Center for Investigative Journalism did their own count. So um, in a way, journalists uh, having to um, bypass the official information from the government, um, they're really serving as uh, justice for their people and providing the information in regards to, okay, how many people actually passed away because of the hurricane. And, you know, those numbers were in the thousands and the official count at first was like less than 10. And thank you. And yes. Amy, thank you. Um, so Gabe, I was interested if you could say a little bit more about how those relationships between the scientists and the indigenous communities developed. You know, if the scientists are there every summer, is it the same ones coming back? Are they relying on people like the local veterinarian to be, you know, the, the intermediary to develop some of those relationships? Sort of how does, how does that become productive and in the first place yeah definitely i think so i think first of all there's a uh, a few different kinds of science that are going on there and there is like parachute science like uh there are researchers that come just for the summer they don't interact with the community much maybe they give a talk um once throughout the summer but they're kind of off in the tundra doing their own thing um, and I think that has like a slight ec economic benefit um, to the community there, but it really, it doesn't have the same kind of impact. It's, it's really using this, you know, ecosystem for a more global perspective. Um, but the, uh, something like the kidney worm study, so that's um, uh, the North Slope Wildlife Bureau employs, um, yeah, all the, all, all different kinds of scientists. So they employ the veterinarian, they employ um, a geologist, they employ a polar bear expert, um, all these different experts. And they, they work for the North Slope uh, Wildlife Department, which is interested in keeping the, the local subsistence food system uh, healthy. So it really starts and ends with that uh, indigenous community. And then they also employ indigenous ecological experts um, at the same department. So, um, and then to your question of how did it all start, uh, it was really that whaling ban that devastated the community in the 1970s. There was this international whaling ban that um, happened because of really faulty, like data gathering practices from researchers that weren't talking with um, indigenous people who knew where those migration corridor corridors were and they, they miscounted uh, the whales. Um, so yeah, that, that conflict is where it all started. And uh, the, the mayor at the time, Eben Hobson, hired on some of those people and, and started doing that collaborative work. So it's, it's really, it's been going for 50 years now. And, and now uh, it's more in vogue, like there's calls for Western science and indigenous knowledge to be incorporated more broadly uh, on a national scale. And, but this community has been doing it for a really long time. And, in some instances, they've learned how to do it well. Great, thanks, Gabe. Let's see, anyone else? Good. One at a time. Okay. <laughs> so first one for Gabriel. You sat, as I understood, you stood in the science facilities, in the dorm with them. And I'm curious about the relationship that you built with them, because if you spend a lot of time with resources, sometimes it gets tricky. And I'm curious about that, how you set the boundary. Yeah, uh, actually the people I was staying with was more in that first category of not having as much interaction uh, with the community. They, you know, they were paying the local indigenous corporation to house them, but, um, and, and there, there were like some efforts, some of them 
made more of an effort uh, than others to share their work. But yeah, it was, uh, I don't think I used any sources from the people I was actually living with day to day. Although it did give me some good context for just kind of the state of science in the community in general. I could hear another one, sorry. <laughs> but in the same direction, to Muriel, you reported in your hometown, and I am curious about how you separate yourself, because you're born there and your family is there, how you separate yourself from the picture and you are just a journalist doing the report. <laughs> Thank you. So this um, takes place in the south of Chile, in Patagonia. I am from uh, the capital, but the still is like uh, of Chilean people, and and uh, I, of course, uh, have grown like I, I know uh, Chiloé Island, where like this story particularly uh, take place. Uh, but I would say, um, as I do with every single story, like I always present myself as a journalist, and I. Uh, try to learn from different views and and of course I just uh, tell the story you know I, I don't try to put uh, my own views uh, on on the table I try to be the the, the most neutral I was when uh, I, before uh, starting my my report I I was doubt um, um, I, I I, I had the doubt if the collectors were going to be willing to talk to me, because of course, I in, from the very beginning, I thought that this was something that uh, complicated them, you know, like that they could maybe prefer a uh, height. Uh, they were very proud. And I realized that I was putting my own like subjectivity probably when facing uh, the story. Um, and then I realized that uh, this is a story about a big conflict, and I really want to be fair telling all the stories, you know, and spending the same time with all the sources. Like, of course, this is not only two, this is, these are many, but uh, the reason I decide to tell this through the scientists is because I thought this was a way to put data on, on the discussion. And in fact, what uh, is very amazing about the whole process is that I started to profile the scientists, like the main scientist, Carolina Leon, she's 40 years old, young scientist, um, in the beginning of the year. Uh, we have meetings in her lab in Santiago, because this group is from Santiago, not from the south. And uh, this bill um, started to suffer some modifications, like some changes during the year, of course. Uh, and suddenly, like only three, four uh, weeks away uh, um, um, uh, ago, uh, because of this big like conflict that has arise uh, in the local place, the um, uh, the the Ministry of Environment in Chile uh, make a call, like in the Congress, like and, and she said, Maisa Roja, the, the, the Minister of Environment, she said, okay, so this bill has been so complicated that. I am going to call uh, four scientists. And one of the scientists she called only three or four weeks ago was Carolina Leon. So uh, it seems uh, to me like it was a proof that to put the eyes on here, it was also a, a, a good way to tell this like from, from, from a neutral way. In the same way, today, the Chilean government, government is trying to find a solution to this uh, big problem. Right. Yes, Maggie. Um, I want to ask kind of the opposite question. Um, and the, um, I guess like preface to this is that arguably it's um, both impossible and improper to try to separate uh, yourself as a person and a journalist from the story that you're telling. So I'd be curious, um, it's kind of an invitation to all of you, but um, whichever you would, of you would like to speak to um, this, I'd be curious to hear like, um, in what ways you think your subjectivity and your um, and like who you are um, influenced um, in a positive way, like th your reporting experience and also the story you have ended up um, telling. Sorry. And I think that's to everyone, right? Was that yeah. to everyone? Yeah. Yes, or whoever wants to answer. How did who you are influence 
Um, yeah. I would say that the relationships that I've had, particularly with Puerto Rican women, uh, shaped this. So from the very first time that I moved from Colombia to the U.S., my first friend was from Puerto Rico. So um, it has been it's a culture that has been uh, shared with me throughout the years through mentors. Now my mentor with this project, Vanessa Colon Almenas. Um, so I think that really shaped it and also my identity is being Latina from Colombia, also shaped how I viewed um, the problems in Puerto Rico, financially, politically. Um, but, and then I also, I was an anthropology minor, so I took a couple classes in Latinx culture where we talked about the history of Puerto Rico and how it went from Spain to the US to its incorporated uh, free associated status that um, they have right now. And it's um, um, the state of Puerto Rico really comes up a lot in my life through those personal relationships too. Anyone else on the panel? Um, yeah, my so my dad is from Appalachian, Virginia, but I grew up right outside of DC. And so uh, a lesson that I actually learned pretty early on is that I needed to be quiet and stop trying to convince people that I understood the history of the area because I was usually taking up <laughs> taking up our interview time by trying to prove to them that I had the background knowledge necessary to ask them the questions about the place where they lived. And like often that was me trying to reassure myself that I was qualified to ask them questions as opposed to actually asking them the questions um and i found that i found that people like i was nervous that people were not going to want to talk to me because there was a very long history of people from outside of the region uh, coming in and telling sort of local color stories uh like oh this place is so different it's so crazy here's a bunch of articles about how weird it is um and like so understandably saying i'm a journalist does not exactly invite a lot of, um, does not invite warm feelings for very understandable reasons, but I found that once I introduced myself to the very first person I wanted to talk to and I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that journalists have really grossly mishandled reporting on this region and I just want you to know that I'm aware of that and that I'm going to be kind of constantly keeping that in mind. Once that person, you know, sort of heard that disclaimer and was like, okay, it seems like this person knows something about uh, what she's reporting on. I found that word of mouth, like my identity became less important as word of mouth kind of got around like, okay, this person tells this other person. I spoke to Hannah and, you know, the conversation was fine. And then like people would tell each other they would say, yeah, you have to talk to Mickey. And then they'd send Mickey an email and say, Mickey, I'm introducing you to Hannah. She talked to me. I think she should talk to you. Like, like it became less and less important as time went on because people were just wanting to actually tell the story and they did not care about me <laughs> explaining my backstory. Thank you. And uh, Jackie, you brought up Vanessa, which reminded me of your field note. So. I thought you might want to just share a bit about the field note that you just wrote. Yeah, so um, Vanessa Colon Almenas, she uh, is a reporter for the Center for Investigative Journalism in Puerto Rico, which I brought up a couple times, but I did not interview her. Um, she was my mentor, and I know we each had five hours of allotted time with uh, our mentors, but even before I arrived in Puerto Rico, I had used up almost all of my time with her. We had weekly check-ins and even when Hurricane Idalia was coming toward uh, Florida, that was, gonna, that was my first hurricane experience. Um, she just stayed in touch with me, making sure that I was okay and that I knew how to be prepared. Um, and I really felt like a little bit of a baby uh, being scared about Idalia compared to what I knew the journalists in Puerto Rico had gone through. So. Um, she picked me up from the airport, greeted me with a hug, um, 
And she also took the time out of her day to drive me around to different towns. She drove, she came with me to Aljuntas too, and she drove me to Ponce. That was uh, two hours away from San Juan, and we shared meals. Uh, we laughed a lot, so it was a really great experience to have her as a mentor. And of course, she was so well connected with a large network of, of journalists uh, in Puerto Rico. So um, yeah, I wrote my field note about our relationship too. Well, thank you for sharing that. And uh, note to self, for those of you who have not yet done your reporting, some of you still need to go in the field, get to know your advisor, your mentor. Uh, good things can happen. So I think this brings us to the end of this session. We're going to have about a five, 10 minute break, and then we'll come back for gender and identity. Before we break, one housekeeping note, uh, during the break, please take your plate and put it in the trash right out here. And secondly, I just want to say this was a fantastic panel and a really great discussion. Also appreciated all the questions, really good questions. So thank you to all five of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>